Okay, this is our team. My name is Laura Walls and I'm a speech language pathologist and I specialize in swallowing and myofunctional therapy. And Dr. Ray Kiefer and I work very closely. We're in neighboring towns. And so uh, we've been working together for over 15 years and he sends a lot of his patients here and um, he's here to talk about some of our stories. And Dr. Canelato and I have been to a couple classes together and have worked together on patients. And he's here from the dental perspective to kind of pull it all together for us. And now I think I have to use this button. Can you see it? Yep. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. All right. Great. Yeah. Okay. So when, when you're looking at dental crowding from a dental perspective, you're looking at the teeth and Chris, we talked about that too, saying, you know, we don't really look at the midline shift or the posture or how it relates to the teeth. But our goal today is really to see the whole picture and to get there more quickly and efficiently with some objective data ideas. And so what I've done is I've outlined some clinical features that you'll be able to see in your page, patients that will really help with your treatment plan. So one of the one of the items that we look at is posture and for uh, one of the items that we look at is posture. And we look with dental crowding, you typically see either forward head posture, like here. And you can see this is one of my patients and her head is forward. And you can tell that not only just by looking at her, but by calculating where the earlobe is in relationship to the, sh to the shoulders. So a head that's in a neutral spine position, the earlobe would be over the shoulders. In this case, her earlobe is about four inches forward. So knowing what that does to the anatomy, a forward head posture is gonna cause bunching of the tongue which will cause myofunctional habits. And we'll talk about this along the way. Another really common posture with dental crowding is this with the retracted mandible. So this is one of my patients with sleep apnea. She has an open mouth posture at rest. You can see her, her chin is retracted here and she has bunching of the tongue into the back of the throat with a lateral tongue thrust. You can see this filth from here is long because the mouth is always open, but the tongue's pulled back here. And I'm gonna talk more about that. So structure, this is what I think you're all familiar with. And so I wanted to bring this in because everybody knows dental crowding includes a high palatal arch, which is here. And they know it contains a, typically a narrow mandible, which is on the bottom here, but you can see this maxilla is really narrow as well. So when you're thinking about it, where does the tongue go? And what is this in the back of the throat here? This is inflammation. And what is this doing to all the structures that are surrounding this high palatal arch and narrow mandible, narrow maxilla? We also see with dental crowding, this is Chris, this is one of your patients and you could talk about it. And he kind of came to this conclusion in the last class that he sees with is this for this is for dental crowding you see chris the frenum that's attached to these two mandibular tori yeah or or i'll see yeah those massive tori associated with that high like frenum like that a lot of times i'll see that attached just to the uh the, the lingual of the anterior teeth kind of high up on that that tissue and they just seem to always present with that those large tori at so the bottom. fascinating to me yeah, I yeah. think it's so cool. And and we can answer questions about that as well. So that's the yeah. structure. But what I want your mind to kind of change and think about is if I have a structure that looks like that, what is the tongue doing? How can a person breathe? How can they close their lips to nasal breathe? And what does sleep look like? So then we get into breathing and this will be, we're going to discuss this at length during the next class. And so we always look to see as a person a mouth breather and probably 50% of the population that are mouth breathers deny it because nobody wants to be a mouth breather. And so we ask our patient, do you breathe from your mouth? They say no, but their mouth is hanging wide open. And so that might not be the best question to ask them on your questionnaire. And so what you look at is how long can you breathe through their, how can they breathe through their nose when they're sitting in your chair from your health history, maybe do they suffer from allergies, sinus surgeries, high nasal resistance? And you, and you wanna find this out on the history because it indicates a lot. It tells you where, what's the tongue doing? What's the sinus complex? 
what's the function of the sinus complex and how does this relate to dentition? The other thing that we see so commonly is that patients with sleep disordered breathing and sleep apnea also have commonly narrow arches and the tongue has no place to go. So kind of take your mind and wrap around, okay, here's our structure, but what's the function of the structure? And why is it causing these sequelae like sleep disordered breathing and sleep apnea? And why can't I have good retention with my patients? So the clinical features of dentition, you guys know, it's crooked teeth, twisted teeth, overlapping teeth, high fang teeth. And here's a couple pictures that show that. But again, I want you to think about how did the teeth get like that? Do you think it's only genetics? So from, from my experience over the past 30 years, when you're looking at crowding like this and you see these lower incisors and you see one pulling back and one pushing forward, that's showing a reverse swallow. So often what would happen is this person would have a lingual bar put in back here once they had ortho. And, but what happens then is the tongue stays in the, on the resting posture on the floor. It's called a low resting tongue posture. So it occludes the back of the throat. And Ray, you want to talk about the lingual bars? Yeah, lingual bars are very common. They can come in two different um, ways of making them. Uh, they can be connected to the first molars. If I use that kind of a lingual bar, I'm usually in a mixed dentition stage. Uh, so the, and it, the molars are banded and then there is a, uh, a round wire that follows the contour of the lower teeth. And really what I'm trying to do is maintain um, space for the erupting teeth and prevent collapse of the posterior teeth. Um, after uh, full dentition treatment, um, I will, um, on the kids that I suspect that won't wear it or adults, uh, I will often put in a lower fixed retainer that's connected to the canines. I, there's different kinds. Some can be connected to each and every tooth. I like the ones that are just connected to the canines just so they can floss and brush underneath the wire. Um, and it, did you, well, you already covered it. Uh, I try not to put them in on people that have like an open bite or tongue thrust, at least if I started with that, just because it seems to can become a point of interest and promote poor tongue posture. That's it. Yeah. And so anything in your mouth, you know, if you have the little buttons on or if you have a cold sore or you've bitten your cheek, our tongue wants to go to that place. And so the goal of myofunctional therapy is really controlling tongue posture so it's resting on the roof of the mouth. And so if you have a reverse swallow or a lingual bar, they're just going to play with that. The tongue's going to stay on the floor of the mouth, which then inevitably ends up often going into the back of the pharynx or the throat, occluding the airway. Next you one. know what I see long term as a dental? So I see a lot of the adults that have had the lingual wire placed on the lower canines is I see posterior collapse. So yeah, they're lower. And then what happens is the bicuspids go lingual. Canines almost look like they're flat across, like the lower anterior teeth are kind of almost flat in the front. Oh, upper, yeah. upper teeth are the same. The canines start kicking out on the uppers and then you get this collapse of the bicuspids. You get this weird, it's almost like a rectangular shape arch rather than a nice yeah. U-shape arch, long-term. So this is what I yeah. see when they're in their 30s and 40s. And then they go into Invisalign and straighten it. And, but, um, but yeah. Chris, that, that can be from long-term memory of the wire. That wire started out straight. And over time, it can oh, okay. turn. So it's like a reverse orthodontic treatment from lingual braces or what have you. Interesting. If, that, if it's straightening out, then that's going to have a tendency to flare those canines. Well, so with the myofunctional habit, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It would be a combination. Yeah. So, uh, and I think you can bend the bar with the myofunctional habit of sucking in the lips and the cheeks and pushing the tongue against it. Is that right? That's possible. Yeah, I think that's possible too. Yeah. But you would know uh, better than I would. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
I've been drilling it in you for long enough, that's for sure. Um, and so start looking at the function of the articulators and as well as the structure, obviously, because that's your job, but we wanna pull this all together. So we look at posture, we look at breathing, we look at the structure, and then we look at the jaw. And a lot of patients with dental crowding, they come in, even kids, I just had a dentist text me today and said, uh, I have this 10 year old that just had extractions and she's having terrible clicking, popping and jaw pain. Can you help this case? And of course, and that kid had dental crowding, so they did extractions. And so with that, every it seems like it just keeps stacking on top of each other, all of these issues. And probably by the end of me drawing attention to you guys are going to be like, what the heck? This is so much information. But if when you start le looking at it in a sequence, it's so effective and you'll start seeing trends in your patients and then have a treatment plan for that. And that's my goal is to bring awareness and then start, start talking about treatment. So this is just a fun fact. And a lot of people, yeah. One okay. question, can you, so if, what if for dental crowding and I, the way I understand it from what I've learned from you is that, you know, it's, it's the, it's the dysfunction of the tongue and, and how we're swallowing. Um, what for those that, so I recognize that as when I, I see this, so that's what I'm looking for. When I see crowding, I'm looking for tongue function and this and that. Can you explain yeah. to everyone what is the like the optimal tongue swallowing what kind of teeth will we see yeah like, for sure i'm I mean, i'm going to go i'm definitely going to go into all that uh what okay, good yeah i'm going to go into all that and i i'm going to teach you guys optimal and what you should be looking for but these are things you might see with dental crowding that you might have not thought about oh hey this might be a sequelae mm -hmm. of dental crowding right and so yeah. sometimes what we could do is address these functions which will help with the jaw, lips, and tongue so that we can promote correct tongue posture. And so by knowing what's going on and then treating that, that's where we get to a good end result. So the remember always when you're looking at the palate, high palatal vaults, it goes into this. The palate is the floor of the sinus cavity here. And so you see up here is the sinus complex. And our goal always is nasal breathing promoting nasal breathing. That's what everybody's talking about. You have to have it during sleep. You have to have it during the day for an anatomic, uh, the autonomic nervous system to respond properly to keep the stress levels low. So when you have a high palatal arch, it starts growing into the sinus complex here and it disrupts nasal breathing. And so that's why often you see those people being mouth breathers. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And mouth breathers often have obviously congestion, poor nasal flow, gut issues, inflammation, autoimmune issues, they get sick easily. And so our goal is to get rid of that and get them into nasal breathing. But with a high palatal arch, it's tough to do sometimes. But addressing all of these uh, features, then you can really make some good progress with your patients. I think I'm pushing the right thing. Hold can on. I make one more note? In, in regards to all the things that you mentioned, as far as the gut health, yeah, um, I, I have heard that uh, mouth breathers have a different flora just because it's more oxygenated in, in the gut. Uh, and so breathing through the breathing through the mouth changes the pH and alkalinity of the saliva. So when they're swallowing it, that's one thing. It does change that, so it disrupts the gut biome. Also. What happens is typically people that mouth breathe often have post nasal drip. And so that's mixed with the bacteria from the sinus complex into the gut. So that creates a, a terrible situation for so many people. Yeah, you really helped me with that <laughs> indirectly. I have that when we, when I did the, um, the trials with you and, and when you helped me with the, uh, with my tongue thrust, I yeah. focused on nose breathing and I had gut issues for my, almost my entire life. And I, they're almost gone. Yeah. Ever since it marked almost around that time when I started uh, being more consistent, nose breathing, lip taping, things like so that. So cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So cool. Uh, yeah. It's so cool. And it's not hard and it seems hard and this is going to seem overwhelming, but I'll get it to a sweet spot at the end. So everybody understands uh, what's going on, but Chris, to go back to your question about 
What are the myofunctional habits? What does it look like? What does it mean? So the cheeks are a really good way to check myofunctional habits without going into an assessment for a dentist. And so when you look at the cheeks, you can see, okay, what's going on here? Where's my mouse? So this is linea alba, and most people have probably seen this before. So linea alba means there's a suckling pattern left over from, this is usually from being a two-year-old, like this little cutie pie next to this mouth. Uh, and you can see her cheeks. She still has the fat cheeks, but you can also see here that she's a mouth breather. And so this probably is going to need to be addressed so that she has good sleep. She's definitely at risk. And this would be something from the pediatric population I would address, address immediately, and it's a quick fix. But what you're going to see in your adult, teen and adult population is you'll see this linea alba. You see it a lot when your patients have clear tray on because they start sucking and there's that little gap in between uh, the molars. Um, but this is something that's indicative of a myofunctional habit of sucking and a tongue thrust, which causes the collapse of the dental arches. And if there's a reverse swallow thrown in there, then changes the front teeth and how they position themselves. This here is cheek biting. So a person that says, I always have cold sores, they might call it cold sores. Um, you can tell that they're biting to stabilize on the weaker side. And so they'll, you'll see bite marks in the cheeks or in the lower lip to try to close their lips. Does that help? Even your adult patients, a lot of them, like when we go back to that one patient that had the retracted mandible, she had the puffy cheeks still. That's because she still suckled her food and didn't have good uh, chewing patterns. So with the you lips, know the dental description yeah. of linea, the dental description of linea alba for us is clenching. That's how we were taught. Oh wow, linea alba, um, and that we didn't realize it was actually because we never learned myofunctional therapy. We never learned. Gotcha. Well, that's super interesting. I think with clenching, you do suck in because it's your mouth is everything is tightening, right? And so we're trying yeah. to hold everything together and the lips closed. So I could see that being a sequelae of it, clenching. But the myofunctional habit going with it, if you're a suckler and you've never lost that anterior posterior tongue position like this, you're gonna get the sucking right. in for sure. Um something else yeah, is yeah. sequelation is these and dry lips. Thinking. Um, Napoleon Dynamite's perfect open mouth breather, breathing through uh, <laughs> his mouth, he never got it together there. And then this tight mentalis is a giveaway for sure for fixing in the front. And that's usually your fat tongue people. And I'll show you a picture of that. So here's the different tongues that you probably see. And I don't know what you guys see most um, in your practice, but it'd be cool to look at. So this is a long, narrow tongue. And with this tongue, this is a tongue thruster for sure. So this is somebody that only goes forward and back. That type of tongue usually has long face syndrome. We call it diencephalic, so long face syndrome. So they'll eat a lot of carbohydrate foods, softer foods, um, that type of thing. That's long tongue, long narrow tongue. Um, they have more difficulty lateralizing the tongue side to side. These are typically open mouth and they get the cold sores on the side. That's this tongue. So check it out to see what kind of tongues you have. This is the wide fat tongue. That's what I have. Uh, and uh, what this does, it rolls over. You can't even see the lower molars. Do you see? And so for this person, yeah. that's a really low resting tongue posture. It's not even pushing against the teeth. So it's not in the middle of the mouth. It's really on the floor of the mouth. And that's something that you'll see. And then the scallop tongue is a low resting tongue posture. And these little scallops here are the marks from the tongue pushing against the teeth. This is really associated with gum recession, uh, airway issues, well, for all of these, uh, airway issues. This person probably has reflux, definitely, and might nasal breathe in the day, in the day but nighttime would open the mouth. What, what do you guys, Chris and Ray, what do you guys normally see in your patients? What type of tongues? Lots of scalloping. Lots yeah, of scalloping. lots of scalloping. And then the wide fat, you know, I, um, I would say, yeah, the larger tongue that 
just that occupies they can't it can't even fit it in their mouth it's like it's, it's in the back of their mouth it's like probably the predominantly predominant patient okay that's so interesting both have airway issues of these two so yeah. that's uh really cool to look at and can you change the shape of the tongue yeah, you can change the shape of the tongue. There's muscles in the tongue. So there's muscles, a long muscle that goes down the center of the tongue. And then there's muscles that cross over. And that's why it's so important to make sure the tongue goes like this and this on the side. But all we, and also can stay on the top, but it connects itself to the roof of the palate. And that's a, that is your optimal resting position for your tongue in order to support the cervical spine in order to keep the jaw uh, muscles relaxed, especially the digastrics. If the tongue, if you're like this and pulled back, this digastric's gonna be really, really tight. Uh, dental crowding, you'll see a lot of speech articulation issues with S sounds or Z sounds, and then T, D, N, L, when they're talking to you, their tongue's kind of like going forward like this and it's going in between the teeth. And they spit a lot because they often have an open bite or there's, there's openings and their mouth is open all the time. Um, swallowing difficulties with dental crowding would be noticing the tongue when they're swallowing that their tongue's sticking out, out between the teeth. They're messy eaters. They like soft foods better and soft foods asking your patients, you know, what's your favorite lunch? And people might say, oh, I have soup or, um, they eat pouches or soft fruits. And so many patients that are sent here they eat only cut up apples or cut up carrots or only baby carrots and they eat little small bites. And you can always tell mm. when they're biting from the front like this, these teeth are getting a lot of movement, but the back teeth are probably developing an open posterior bite. And so asking them what they eat, I can't even tell you how many patients that I get here and they have sandwiches, uh, small sandwiches. They don't eat the crust of pizza. They eat hamburgers, which is considered a mechanical soft, oatmeal for breakfast, scrambled eggs, nothing like biting into an apple anymore, right. nothing like biting into a big carrot or a piece of broccoli. Everything's cut for them. And there is a great place for cut food for the back to get the tongue to lateralize, but to get to get that bite in that on the anteriors really helps set the jaws. And you can always tell when somebody's preparing for swallowing or how the teeth are erupting the side that they chew on because the teeth will erupt more quickly on the side that's being used. So it's really cool to see if all of the teeth have, they've lost all of the teeth on one side and the other teeth are a little bit loose, you know they're not using that side. So there's gonna be a structural asymmetry from the jaws to the hips. So it's cool to look at and just, and think about and just even talk to them like, hey, what'd you have for lunch today? or uh, what's your favorite dinner? What's your favorite restaurant around here? And kind of just, it's, it strikes a conversation or have your team do that. Um, a quick thing to ask them to do. I think we talked about this a little bit, but if you take, if you look at a swallow, the swallow is pretty much going to talk about the posture, the breathing, the jaw, the lips, and the tongue. And it's a really easy, fast way to do it. So if I'm going to turn my head to the side so you guys can see, but if people go forward like this, they're probably comfortable with the anterior chin position, which means their mouth is going to be open. That's going to be a comfortable position. So if you see them drink mm -hmm, and be able to swallow with no water coming out with the masseter, you guys should try it. So take a sip, hold it in your mouth, smile and then drink and see how it feels. Is it smooth? Does the epiglottis hit really hard where you hear a big gulp? Does the head want to move forward and back to push the bolus mm -hmm. into the back of the throat? It's a great strategy. And when you guys have the patient in the chair, you always have them rinse. You know, they could take a sip of water and you could watch it happening. So some things you might see a patient, they turn their cup like this. And so they're only drinking from the one side, right? So you know the structure is going to be off and asymmetric because it's how we use it that the teeth erupt and sit in the place that they're in. Does that make sense? Can you do it, Ray? <laughs> yeah. Good job. Uh, I've been this, doing the app, yes I can. Okay, good job. Uh, this is a really <laughs> cool, fast way yeah, I can to do make, it. can you do it, Chris? Yeah. 
so glad. Good job. Uh, it will, it really takes about three seconds. Like I get it. You guys, you know, you sell time. And so, um, but to be able to say, Hey, is there a myofunctional habit happening here? I want to see how this person swallows and have them do it. You can say, Hey, hold yeah, up your mouth I for love a couple that. seconds, breathe through your nose. Is it easy? And you'll see people that are like, they look like they're, you know, you just dunk their head underwater. They can't have nasal breathing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they won't talk during it. No. Um, and so it's a really cool strategy. Well, we, have it every, we have it every day with our, yeah, we have it almost every day with our restorative patients when we work on them because there's so much water as we're drilling, there's so oh. much water coming in their mouth. And so okay. they can't, the patient can't uh, breathe through their nose and hold water in their mouth. So they end up like having to swallow and they're, it's, you know, they're, they're constant battle throughout the whole procedure. And that is the majority of patients. Well, majority of patients are like that. they need restorative work? Do you know? know? Why are they clenching? Why are they... Uh, why are, are their teeth yeah. getting cracked and cracked? Why is their dentition mixed? You know, what's going on with that? And so many yeah. times you can lead it. Why do, why do people over the age of 45 or 50, why do the lowers always start going crooked? Our posture changes a lot over time. So it's one of those things. Yeah. It's a really cool link. If you could look at this picture, posture, breathing, jaw, lips, tongue, just by taking a sip of water, that's easy. Mm -hmm. and super effective then you'll go oh, okay hold on there's something more going on here so you guys know all these i think uh i'm just gonna say it and i i just want you to know there's so many possibilities or potential causes for dental crowding and i think there's so many schools of thought as to why it happens or what's happening but basically these nine the prolonged thumb or finger sucking or extended pacifier use we we know that typically that suckling pattern that's using collapses the arches. And so many of the kids today use, drink those pouches, you know, it's crushed food, like in a bag because it's easy and it's not messy, messy and they're easy to take places. And so parents give that to kids and it keeps that suckling pattern happening like this. So they're mashing their food with their tongue and not using the teeth to bite. And so the same yeah. thing with this pr prolonged thumb sucking, finger sucking, um, upper airway can, obstruction, nasal congestion. Obviously, if you can't breathe through your nose, you're going to breathe through your mouth. We go the path of least resistance. But why is that happening? How many people have gotten turbinate reduction or sinus surgery and they have to go back for remediation? A lot, over 50%. Well, the thing is with breathing, it's autonomic nervous system response. We don't think about it. We don't think about swallowing. We don't think about blinking. We don't think about digesting. We don't think about our heart beating. And so what happens is there's a nasal cycle. So one side breathes for 90 minutes, then the brainstem goes, okay, next one. And then this guy breathes for about 90 minutes and then they alternate. What happens with surgery is they do the surgery but they don't train the nose to breathe. And so the thing is what happens is the turbinates refill up again with nitric oxide and then they obstruct the sinus complex again. And so with everything we do, there's a sequelae and we want to make sure that we're doing it in the right way to promote nasal breathing. And so when you're teaching your patient to do that too, you can get them to breathe just by plugging their nose like this and nodding their head like this 10 to 20 times and opening, and they'll be able to breathe through their nose. So you can go, that's nasal breathing. Keep practicing that. So the brainstem could then say, oh yeah, I'm going to make this an automatic habit. Um, if there's missing teeth or an open bite, you know, that's a sign of dental crowding, poor oral motor function, weak oral musculature, long face syndrome, the big lips, a lower hanging jaw, genetics play a part in it, swallowing issues, tongue mashing, eating, soft foods we talked about, speech, postural issues, and myofunctional habits. Like that's a lot of this. And you guys are probably like, okay. Uh, and one way to go through this quickly with your patient is just by adding this form into your health questionnaire. And it's 10 questions to go through posture, breathing, jaw, lips, tongue, speech, and swallowing and sleep. And so this will just tell you if your patient has five or more of these issues, clearly they have a myofunctional habit that's contributing to the dental crowding. It's an easy form to use.
And now you guys are probably, this picture is so cute because it's from a dentist office. Does everyone know Nemo? Do you guys know the movie? Mm-hmm. Do you remember? So these yeah. fish, uh, they're escaping the dental office. And I want you guys to escape that way of thinking that it's only the structure that you're fixing. I want you to think about it like, okay, what's mm-hmm. the alternative? What can I do to make this better? How come I'm seeing these trends? Like Chris, you're saying you have bilateral mandibular tori with a thick in front of them. Why is that, that the lowers are clenching so hard and they're breaking down? Well, clearly they don't have a good jaw tongue ratio, which is a T-R-M-R. It's a tongue ratio where you open your jaw and you put your tongue up. And so what do they consequently do? They have tight sublingual and digastric muscles and they pull backwards and all they can do is clench their teeth. And so mm. then what happens consequently is our, our bones say, oh, I get it. Where I'm clenching, so I need to make bigger bones to hold these other bones in place. And so I'm going to throw off all these osteocytes that create these tori to help try to salvage the teeth and keep them in place. But then what happens is the sequelae mm. of that is there's no room for the tongue. So now right. we have this whole buildup and it's like, now where does the tongue go? It either goes forward and we open the mouth. So we have a mouth breather and gut issues and health issues and sleep issues, or it goes into the back of the throat and then we get an obstructive sleep apnea. So what do we do? Ta-da! Now <laughs> we go into how do we treat this? And so what we've created at our practice is we've taken the past 15 years and we put our exercises into play and we created a mouth a MouthWorks platform that incorporates all of the exercises that we've done per diagnosis, including dental crowding, so that each dentist can go ahead and treat their patient in their own practice without having to have access to me or another myofunctional therapist. Super effective, it's easy. Um, It makes money for the dentist and it also isn't expensive for your patient, but it's very effective. And um, so what we do is, our team will set up a demo and the, the My MouthWorks team will brand the app for your practice. So this is mine, Innovative Oral Solutions. There's another one, Sinclair Smiles, and another one, White, White Birch. So we'll skin it to have your own logo on there. And then what we do is link this to your Facebook. We can go ahead and link any of these to your Instagram. You can promote specials on it, and then they can click and do their exercises. On that app, what we do is we follow the patient and look at from an algorithm perspective, what are the trends with the different diagnoses and how they're doing well on their exercises. The other thing Dr. Kiefer and I created was the OPA, the oral placement appliance. And Ray, do you wanna talk about this a little bit? Um, Gosh, how long ago was that? It was a while ago. ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, I felt like Laura was managing the issues with like, it, it was really with linea alba and scalloping that um, I had become aware of. And um, I felt like people, as long as they were good at doing their exercises and therapy could manage it during the day. But I saw this uh, disconnect when they were sleeping and, uh, you know, clenching, grinding, poor tongue posture or sleep. Uh, So I came to Laura and I said, hey, you know, let's create a device that can get in between the cheeks and the teeth and in between the teeth and then at the same time position the tongue in in an ideal position. Yeah. Uh, And so we, oh, I use this for nighttime management for correct tongue placement and um it's super effective mm-hmm. for so many of my patients and uh, people that love it, they love it. And it's awesome. And it takes anywhere from three days to three weeks to get used to it. It's an off the shelf product. You can trim it to suit the patient's mouth size. We typically, what we do, which it has been really successful is we have them wear it as is for one week. And then we have them come back in during their next appointment. And we say, okay, how does it feel? Do you need any trimming? We look to see what's going on. And a lot of times, the linea alba will be lighter in color and you can see the scalloping of the tongue gone. And so we know that we're promoting that correct 
lingual placement. So one of the things that we didn't realize during the study and during the FDA clearing process is what it did was promote uh, good REM sleep. And so people responded on the study to say that they were having really vivid dreams. And so that was super promising to know that we were the correct tongue posture and yeah. stopping of grinding really helped with the sleep quality as well. And that was me. And, you know, I have that, that, you know, I will say that the tongue bowl part yeah. really yeah. helps train my tongue. It's a great training tool at night. So it like, like keeps your tongue lifted and. Yeah. So, yeah. um, Right, you can kind of see it right here. So what we've done is here's the wings of the oral placement appliance. Uh, you need to back it up. Sorry, thank you. Can you go back? I'm going. Got it. There you go. Yeah, Thanks. right there. I can't see you, so um, your secret's safe with me. I can only see these screens. Um, okay, so here, right here are the wings and Dr. Kiefer, that, like he said at the beginning of this, um, one of the things that were causing difficulty with retention was that linea alba and that sucking in. And so what we wanted to do and what he suggested was that we create these wings to stop that sucking in. This is the bite plate here, which protects the teeth. And Chris, what you're talking about is down here. Um, bowl. This, yeah, yeah, the bolt keeps the tongue position from a reflex perspective, it stimulates on the tongue to push it up to the roof of the mouth. So it's a super yeah, cool device. It. And uh, one of the things that's super funny that we also didn't think about, but my kid did it, he woke up and he had these eight blisters on the inside of his lip. And he had myofunctional habits in grinding. And what we found out that if you suck, it really is a good diagnostic tool to show that somebody's sucking in their sleep because it made these little blisters, you can cut those out though, but it's a good way to check what's going on at night yeah. for sure. Yeah, so this is a really cool product as well. And we incorporate that into the My Mouthworks app and the OPA is part of it for dental crowding sleep and for uh, TMD as well. It's really cool. So that's our spiel on dental crowding. I hope, does that, does it kind of give you a clearer perspective of how other things influence the dental crowding? Does it make it clearer? Yeah. Definitely. Laura, I have a question for you. It's Mary. Um, so if someone's in traditional splint therapy, which is what, you know, most people are doing with TMD, um, what would be, Use, how would you switch them to the OPA? And is it more like a deprogramming type of thing or? Uh, that's a really good question. I think I can answer it from, from a perspective, from my experience perspective and Ray and Chris, you could probably talk a bit more from a dental perspective, but um, so for, for how we do it is we have them wear the OPA during the day. And typically when they're walking, hanging out on the computer, and so what it does, the side wings relaxes the masseter muscles. And so I think the difference between the splint and the OPA is it's actually relaxing the muscles and promoting the correct placement in the symmetrical plane. Whereas I think that you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, I think splints are built up to cause relaxation if it puts them in where I think where they think the muscles or the mouth wants to be. Is that right, you guys? Uh, it it depends on. I mean, sometimes splints are made flat, and um, yeah. I, I I would say an orthotic has the uh, indents to position the jaw in a particular spot. Um, okay. So my only comment on the splints versus the orthotics, if you're trying to manage grinding, the grinding I think is typically coming from uh, an incomplete airway. So then if you add a big slab of plastic to the top teeth in particular, you're forcing the tongue back further. And uh, that's why I will often see people not tolerate the maxillary splint very well because it's challenging their airway even more. Yeah, that's super mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Chris, and I, and I, yeah, I have found that the, op that, Traditional maxillary splint, again, like Ray's saying, it just, you can still clench with the same kind of intensity. You're just in a different jaw position. So you get, I mean, you get like 
I don't know what the statistic is, but it's like 50% which of, of, of the benefit from it. Um, a lot of anterior deprogrammers are used, which can cut down uh, clenching intensity. And um, But I found that the OPA device, when I wore it, I did cut off the wings uh, um, and it felt a little bit like an anterior deprogrammer. It was like almost like a combination for me, but I found that the tongue lifted prevented me really from clenching. It was kind of interesting. Um, I didn't clench with the same intensity on that little device. So it did relax me more. So uh, but with you. flat plane splints, you can still clench. And, and what you can do is have a patient clench together without any device, feel their temporal muscles, pop in a maxillary night guard, have them clench, and you'll feel the same bulge. If, mm. if you do it with an anterior deprogrammer, you'll change that. And if you do the OPA, you can see how it's changed. It doesn't, you can't clench with the same intensity. So yeah. it does. The idea with with NTI's anterior positioners, um, for us anyways, sometimes it creates that moon in the teeth. And the idea, I think, but everything I've yeah. read, it was supposed to be short term. So it was kind of during remediation yeah. of why those muscles are so tense and then doing therapy to help calm yeah. the muscles down and then ditch it. But people wear it forever. But I think those are mm -hmm. for what we base this off. We built up the anterior portion right here you can't really see it up here but of the opa about three millimeters the back is two and a half so it's 0.5 of a millimeter higher so it gives that kind of idea but it's soft there's two durometers um yeah so it kind of takes off the clenching from here and makes you put more into the anteriors and so it gives more of an equal bite was the idea behind yeah. it mm -hmm. yeah but it's fda cleared for um, eliminating maladaptive behaviors, normalizing swallows, and correct tongue placement was, was the idea. That's why how it was FDA cleared. Does that answer the question, Mary? It does. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, if anyone else has questions, you can put them in the chat. Okay. And Going back to, um, I wasn't sure if the people that were on realized we are recording this. We will have the ability to review it later. So if there were some really nice checklists that you gave Laura to add to um, their health history and interviews with their patients, um, you know, those, those will be available after um, we just um, archive the, the footage here from tonight. Okay, yeah, anybody can always contact me and we're, I'm happy to go over this individually with with a doctor or their and or their team to show them how this all works and comes together as well. One of the things I asked last week, um, but I thought of sort of a follow up question to Laura was um, when the doctors are bringing in the patients for these particular issues, is this part of the initial oral examination or do you identify it, say, in the hygiene chair? And um, then obviously Dr. Kiefer, maybe not for you and hygiene, but um, if, um, you know, how do you identify? And then it, would this be a follow-up exam um, to address these specific issues just in terms of the logistics perspective? So I think Ray, yeah. you do it a little bit differently, but how, how we've trained Dennis to do this with the My Mouth Works app is we have it as part of their initial consultation and okay. for consultations coming in for complaints. So if somebody comes in with jaw pain or um, relapse or they're starting to have headaches, then we start asking these questions again and that's been really effective. Good, okay, mm -hmm. that helps. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, I don't see any other questions coming through chat. So we can probably wrap it up for this evening. Next week, we'll be doing uh, sleep, same time, same place, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And I thank Laura, Dr. Kiefer, and Dr. Catalano again for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks, thanks guys. so much, everybody. Thank Have you. a great night. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, thanks. Thanks.